hell of a week in the sports. We're going to break all of it down. But Blaine, apparently you scared some poor Asian kid to death this weekend. Okay, I'm one of those guys. Uh, I live in an apartment, so I have an apartment complex type of gym. Not the biggest place in the world. Not a lot of benches walk around. There's two benches. Really one you can really use. I like to go work out late at night. Like right. So you're a serial killer? No, because I like to be the only one in there, and I like to have the availability of everything in the gym. All right? So when I go in there, I take two scoops of pre-workout. All right? <laughs> at, a, at what time? At, like, uh, what time? I, well, I probably got in there at 11.15. And you took two scoops of pre-workout yeah. at 11.15 at mm-hmm. night? Yeah. So I get in there, beanie on, hoodie on. I'm probably 30 to 45 minutes uh, you know, into my workout, and I'm playing DMX as loud as possible. <laughs> as loud as you can imagine. Imagine something loud, and I was playing DMX louder. I just got done doing a set of uh, of uh, prayer plates, right? So you get a 45, and you're doing that on your Tricep. back. Yeah, so I got up. I didn't know anybody was in there. And these things hurt, you know? I got up. I was fighting a lot of demons. It was a long weekend. I got up and screamed the F word as loud as I possibly could. And I didn't know there was an Asian kid right behind me. <laughs> I scared this man. I'm talking about... I saw the fear. What did he and do? Like he did panicked and took his ear pods out really quick. <laughs> I was like, my bad, my bad, my bad. He's like, okay, it's okay. Like, I feel bad. He'll probably never come back to the gym. Did he yeah. leave? Huh? Did he stay in no, there? No, no. He, he, I think he left in camp. I don't know if he went to the bathroom, he calmed down. The for a <laughs> yeah, there might be a serial killer in here, but he yeah. came back. Didn't say another word to me the entire day. And I understood. What if he what if he sees Blaine like in the in the breakfast nook area? <laughs> just runs, the next runs away. Hey, how you doing, man? Yeah. Good to see you. Or no, he's like, officers, there he is. Dude, I felt so bad for that kid. Yeah, well, look, you you go into the gym, you better expect the unexpected. Yeah, I'm I'm He's I'm, better for it. I'm in there just trying to move the entire the gym around. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm picking up treadmills and stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, congrats on that. Uh, University of Georgia offensive lineman Devin Willick died tragically in a car accident this past weekend. The Bills, Bengals, and Giants advanced from a wild, wild card weekend, and we'll preview tonight's matchup between the Cowboys and the Buccaneers. I'm Jay Crane. It's Monday, but let's get it going, people. It's Crane and Company. We watch athletes compete all the time, and they always wow us with their unbelievable ability and their ability to prepare at a very high level. Sometimes we almost forget that they're made of flesh and bone, just like the rest of us. Now, after seeing the scary DeMar Hamlin situation in Buffalo and yesterday morning hearing about the tragic passing of Georgia sophomore offensive lineman Devin Willick and recruiting analyst Chandler LaCroix, it's a terrible reminder of just how fragile even the best and most prepared of us are. We get upset about losses, and we get excited about wins, and we should continue to do that. That's part of the essence of sport. But we all know that there is so much more to life. So it doesn't matter if you're an accountant, an NFL wide receiver, a candle salesman, or any occupation. Make sure you hug your loved ones today and every day, because life is so unbelievably fragile, and we should never take at least at ever a second for granted. I'm going to go ahead and bring in my uh, co-host, David Cohn, here. David, you know... Um, we're going to get into this NFL stuff, and and obviously, you know, there's some some wild finishes, some wild, crazy games. Just uh, it, it seems like it's it's there's just been a lot of of you know scary situations and tragedy. And there's always stories, and and again, when you have this many people, uh, you know, on the planet and in, in the world, there's always mm-hmm. going to be something. But you know, sometimes it, it is good to take stock and realize that we know how important sports are. We love sports; it's a fabric of our society. But you know, there's so many things that are so much more important. No doubt. And, and first things first, we have a lot of friends and family over in the Atlanta mm-hmm. and Athens and Augusta areas of Georgia. Please reach out, stay, stay on the lookout for how you can help and assist over the coming weeks because there are some families and communities that are going to need all the support that they can get. I've been trying to look for different ways already for links on, um, you know, donations and, and ways to help with the family and things like that. Um, but hopefully this will serve, you know, as as a lesson as well for some of the younger 
kids out there to understand, look, this happened at 2.45 a.m. Not much good happens after midnight. You know, go home even after a celebration in the afternoon for a championship season and, and you know, be home. But prayers up to everyone involved in the situation, and we'll keep keep you posted on how you can help. Yeah, and uh, Blaine Crane, former Western State Colorado wide receiver, my co-host as well. You know, you go from the highest of highs uh, to to the lowest of lows in, in a very short period of time. And uh, again, you know, it's it's one of those things where, you know, you just cringe to think about it. A, a, a life with so much promise, two lives with so much promise. I mean, he was from uh, New Jersey, went down to Georgia to play, 6'7", 320. Uh, just again, man, just very sad. Well, you realize uh, as immortal as these guys look on TV, like they're still humans. Yeah. And they're still people. You're not an invincible person. So really, you know, you really need to sit down and, you know, count your blessings, you know, every day because you never know when something bad is going to happen. I mean, we're, we're seeing stuff now. We're really not used to seeing these car wrecks. What happened in Alabama, I know those are two separate things. But, but it doesn't matter if they're athletes, if win the Heisman, go play in the NFL. They're people first. Yeah. All right, they're people first. And you and you have normal, ordinary human problems other than away from sports. So prayers out to the Georgia family, his family, you know, Kirby Smart and all those guys. It's just what a tragedy, man. Yeah, it's it's very sad. And, and Kirby put out a statement. Uh, and again, we'll see if we can find some links on, on any day. Yeah. And junior offensive lineman Warren McClendon was also involved in the accident. He he had just declared for the NFL, but it sounds like he's going to pull through and be all right. Yeah, uh, again, it, you know, it, it could have been worse, but it's still tragic. Uh, tough segue here. Uh, we got to knock it out to pay the bills, though. Uh, the NFL playoff action continues. We are one step closer to Super Bowl 57. It was a wild, wild card weekend. And for the NFL Divisional Round, check out DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. New customers can bet just $5 and get 200 in free bets instantly. You need to use our code booster, B-O-O-S-T-E-R. Also, download that DraftKings Sportsbook app. Again, like I said, new customers, go and download it and use our code, can bet $5 on the NFL Divisional Round and get $200 in free bets instantly. That is only at DraftKings Sportsbook with our code booster. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Guys, I was all over the same game parlays this mm -hmm. weekend. Uh, hit one for about $310. And if the Chargers would have just handled business, I would have won another one for $255. Bucks. But look, I, I like a little sprinkle on the same game parlay. Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to go Zeke, Leonard Fournette, anytime touchdown. Maybe take the Cowboys plus 14 and a half. You're looking at over plus three, 350 odds. I mean, it's uh, the same game parlay is it's the fast and easy payouts, which is what I like. Uh, and it, it's the best sports book there is. Let's and a lot of this. options out there, too. A lot more options that? than Georgia Tech under Paul Johnson. Yeah, the uh, there was a lot of novelty bets out there, novelty yep. prop bets this weekend, which were cool. Yep, Zeke, uh, The they keep saying, I, I, I keep hearing, I've heard it from multiple people, the best bet is Zeke Elliott over 12 and a half carries. I like it. For the game, which it kind of seems like that. Blaine, you've been DraftKings... You know, Dawson Knox, you're one. my hero. Bro. Yeah, you plus twelve hundred, first touchdown score. Hero, I, you know, I had a vision the night before that it was came to you in Dawson. a dream. Yeah, it came to me in a dream that Dawson was going to catch the first touchdown. Because where are they looking at? Stephon, Stephon, Stephon. Next thing you know, there's some six three white kid in the corner of the end zone. Everyone forgot about. And he's wide open, but uh, he wasn't games. wide open. It was that's what was crazy about it. He had to like one hand catch behind exactly. the guy. He, can, well, he converted you know, an arrow into backyard a football, baby. <laughs> yeah, backyard football job. Where my Josh Allen, Dawson Knox were mind mouth. Yeah. Right <laughs> well, well, the hilarious part was I knew you had that bet, and I'm watching the game, and I'm watching with Reed and and my soon to be mother in law, and. I'm watching Daw Dawson Knox off the play action slip into the flat. And I knew, knew you had the bet. And I'm like, all right, it's covered up. Josh is going to work to the top. You know, maybe somebody's coming on the over behind. and He's going to hit him for a touchdown. Then all of a sudden, I see him convert it to the wheel, and I see Josh look at him and throw the ball. And right when the ball touches his hand, I got so excited, the remote was in my left hand, that I accidentally switched it off YouTube TV. No. So for like 10 there. seconds, I had no idea. I was like, nobody move. Didn't he move or say anything? Went back and looked and saw that Dawson Knox scored the touchdown and just called Blaine. I was like, man, it's plus 1,200? Plus 1,200. Oh, man, that's a It's just one of those good feelings when you hit a bet like that because at the end of the day, you can't finish in the negative on the day. Yeah, it's right? exactly right. I ended up going two and four on the day just because Justin Jefferson was two inches away from scoring a touchdown. I had that Other than too. that, you know, I mean, it's a win. You don't, I don't have to be anxious to, you know, the rest of the day and just pray to hit a bet. Yeah, well, I, I had a, a touchdown score parlay where I hit Austin Eckler, I hit Dawson Knox, I hit Zay Jones, I hit Saquon Barkley. Mm -hmm. The only one that didn't score was Justin Jefferson. And he was an inch away. I know. 
I, th- I, I thought he scored. You were at the house when I thought yeah, he scored. Yeah, But let's go ahead and get in this wild card, uh, NFL wild card recap. Mm. By the way, we're taking call-ins today. Yes, sir. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button as well. Follow us on all socials. What do you got, Coney? Man, how about we start at Baltimore at Cincinnati? Yeah, hell of a game. Uh, we went into late last night. The Bengals got the, the breaks that they needed in the second half, including that humongous fumble, the, the game-changing play. The fumble at the goal line with Huntley going in when he tried to jump over was returned all the way for a touchdown. You know, I, I expected this score to be a little bit larger. I know, I know a touchdown you still feel like is a lot in the playoffs, but the Ravens offensively, you know, I watched that front seven that they have on defense, and they controlled the game. The Bengals offensive line looked like the old Bengals offensive line. I didn't realize that Jonah Williams, the tackle who I believe played at Bama, yep. uh, for the Bengals gave up. was tied for giving up the most sacks of any offensive lineman in the NFL this year. But Joe Burrow and the Bengals continue to find a way. How do you survive, whether it's in the NCAA tournament, whether it's in the NFL playoff, or any format where you have to win multiple games to have a chance to play and win a Super Bowl, championship, whatever? You have to be able to win in multiple ways, and you have to catch some of the breaks. They did catch some breaks last night. We know the Ravens are not this unbelievably explosive offense, but I thought they ran the ball well enough uh, with J.K. Dobbins, with Gus Edwards, and with Huntley uh, to be able to keep them open down the field. You saw Mark Andrews in that second half. You really saw that second quarter, them kind of get into a rhythm, uh, and then they got into a funk after that. But when you have the weapons like Tyler Boyd and Joe Mixon and T. Higgins and Jamar Chase, two things I know will be open always, Waffle House and Jamar Chase. Those are the two things. He does an unbelievable job of creating space. What he was doing against Marcus Peters and the chemistry that Joe Burrow and him have, it seems like everything's an option around. He can sit it down. He can convert it. You know, you can go inside. You can go outside kind of the way Cole Beasley and and, uh, Josh Allen were working yesterday. But when I look at the Bengals, they won this game ugly which against the Ravens, a team you just played mm-hmm. uh, that knows your tendencies. We, we all know how you know how that rivalry goes, and, and they're kind of similar in the way exactly. they go about things. I just I feel like the Bengals are a team that just knows how to win. There you sometimes go. it's ugly, sometimes it's pretty, but a win is a win is a win that is a win, David. I expected uh, the Bengals to be more effective on offense. I think we all did, despite the fact that they are very uh, banged up on the offensive line, which I think that's going to play into a lot of people's uh, future wagers here coming down the stretch looking at the Bengals. But make no mistake, this is NFL playoff football. You add on top of that that this is a divisional rivalry, and you add on top of that is their second time playing in two weeks. Look, I I thought the Bengals might could cover the, what was it up to, eight and a half, nine and a half, something like that. But still, it's not surprising at all that this Ravens team playing playing the Bengals for the second time in two weeks was able to not only keep the game close, but really was you know in possession of the game down the wire. Our boy Justin Houston, all the pieces that those the Ravens have added on defense really showed up late. And Tyler Huntley made plays, man. He really Tyler did. Huntley made plays to keep the Ravens in that football game. So I don't I think it's I think it's disrespectful for J.K. Dobbins just to come out and say at the end of the game that well we would have won that game if Lamar Jackson is playing. Maybe that's true. Maybe that's true, but Tyler Huntley made the plays to be able to keep that thing close. Now, one yard away, you know, if he hands the ball off and J.K. Dobbins uh, fumbles it, maybe we're all saying it should have been a quarterback sneak. The other way around, we're saying, well, maybe it should have been a handoff to to J.K. Dobbins. Either way, Tyler Huntley made the plays down the stretch for the game to be close. Yeah, well, the problem I have with it it is if you're going to do the push him in the back thing, do it the way the Eagles do and have him get low and push him. Don't don't jump jump over the pile. There you go. Like, the, the, those two things the, the shouldn't exist. That's together. from not, fourth and inches. Not, yeah. That's Trevor Lawrence did that the other day. The, genius. It's, it, well, yeah, you saw you saw him score the touchdown on yes. it. You saw Doug Peterson say, you know, that was brilliant. It was the touchdown on the two-point conversion. I believe it was the two-point conversion. But, Blaine, you know, when, it, when I look at, at the Bengals moving forward, the run game need, really has to be there. I mean, jo, Joe Burrow can throw it 40, 45 times, and they can still find a way to win games. But if they're going to operate at a peak level, at a Super Bowl winning level, they have to be able to run the ball. Looking at it right here, Joe Mixon had 11 carries Mm -hmm. for 39 yards. Their longest rush was 11 yards. Joe Burrow got sacked four times. How worried are you about the Bengals being able to have some semblance of balance on offense? Because I know the Bills' defense isn't the best, but you're going to have to score with the Bills. All right, the, the Bills are For going sure. to score. How worried are you right now about the Bengals up front as opposed to, 
looking at the end of the season, it's amazing they go on this huge win streak mm -hmm. when the offense doesn't give up sacks and they're able to run the ball. That's not a coincidence. Well, the thing about it is I'm just as worried as I was last year. I mean, with losing Lyle Collins, I mean, that's your best offensive lineman that you had. But you're not going to probably face another D-line as good as the Ravens, another defense as good as the Ravens, especially up front. I mean, Clay is Campbell. They got all these JPP running. You got Roquan Smith. Uh, you have Queen at the other side of the linebacker, Marcus Peters. You have Humphreys. You have uh, Kyle Hamilton. This is extremely solid defense. And really, the only other defensive line that someone compared to it, I mean, I would say the Dolphins. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have Chubb. You have, you have Phillips. Um, you have uh, Wilkerson, uh, D. Lyman. So the Bengals needed to get past this game, and I'm not surprised they didn't run the ball well, um, especially the way they are up front with Joe Mixon. But you still had the weapons and outside and Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. So if you're the Bengals, you need to get past this game. That's fine. I didn't think Tyler Huntley played a bad game, but I do think you still need Lamar Jackson if you want to get to the top. Mm -hmm. Oh, for get sure. Deep, yeah, deep yeah. in the playoffs. Where I don't think it's more on the Ravens. Lamar came out off. He said his knee was still unstable. He still had some things around his knee that he didn't feel comfortable with. I mean, that's neither here or there. I'm not the team doctor, so I really don't know. But if you're if you're the Bengals right now, there's a couple things you feel good about. Your defense is the same kind of defense from last year, right? You're, you're really not that great interior. All right, you're just not. You're going to give up uh, some some big plays on the ground. That's where you are. But in the playoffs, the same thing happened last year. They turn you over. Yeah. Right. They'll bend. The Bengals will bend. But in the red zone, it's hard for them to break. And they make big turnovers at key moments. In the playoffs, that's stuff you have to do against the Bills against the Chiefs, because your defense is, you're going to give up points against the Bills. You're going to give up points against the Chiefs. It's just, there's there's not a defense in the NFL that won't. But you have to keep Joe upright, which is tough to do. Let, and the good thing about the Bengals, they know who their best player is. Yeah. And Jamar Chase. Yeah. Ten catches, 90 yards. They know, and a lot of teams struggle with that, not giving the ball to their best players. You mean you the, talk Chargers about the Chargers and the Vikings? Yeah. The Vikings, right? You got to, you ride with the guys who got you there. And that's what the Bengals do. And that's why, I'll, one, I believe in Joey Shiesty till the day I die. I believe in Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, these guys, this offensive scheme. I thought Zach Taylor called a nice game. I really did the head coach of the Bengals. But if you, anything, if you're the Bengals, you had to get past this round. Yeah. All right? Because now it turns well, into a mean, scoring fest. Well, you know, what, you know what it reminds you of? It's like that, that first round NCAA tournament game yeah. where yeah. You're, the, you're the three seed and you may be playing like a pesky 12 seed where they're all seniors and they've been playing together since they were in AAU. And uh, it just seems like one of those games where you just survive. Like it reminds me a little bit of, of during Auburn's Final Four run, the New Mexico State game a little bit. Mm -hmm. you, some of them you just have to survive. But you mentioned Kyle Hamilton, Blaine. He's one of two rookies that have really exceeded my expectations. Yeah. Him and Kayvon Thibodeau. Well, uh, yeah. Well, he's not there. really playing that 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 high he's a, safety. He's not position. a high safety. Yeah, he's a nickel. That's he's what I thought. He's glorified because his hips aren't good. Yeah, he can't. You don't want well Kyle Hamilton literally over the slot every time, saying, "All right, I'm a guard, Richie James. I'm a guard, uh, some of these slot guys." Uh, the, the Ravens do a really good job of playing to their players' strengths. Mm -hmm. I think that is one of the, the best qualities that John, John Harbaugh has and one of the re re, uh, reasons the Ravens are able to maintain and, and consistently have success because they play to their strengths. So those are two young guys uh, that, I'm, that have really exceeded my expectations. Yeah. Uh, in, in you saw Kyle one. Hamilton come downhill, force that fumble, yep. and recover the yep. fumble yesterday. It, it, it surprised me a little bit. All right, so talking about surviving in the first round, a game that was very similar uh, was Bill's Dolphins right, uh, in a lot of ways. Same division, right? They've already played twice this year. Uh, Dolphins also with a third-string quarterback, not just a backup. Uh, Bills heavily favored, and the game comes down to the wire. What do you guys make of the Bills-Dolphins here? I, I'm really worried about this Bills defense. All right, you're not going to face a worse offense than what you just faced. You know, losing Von Miller was huge. I said it exactly right when it happened. It's, you got Von Miller to give you a chance to beat Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. All right, that, that's, that's why you got him. Now that he's out, they've got, I like Milano, but, but you don't have that, that game breaker defensively. You have some guys in the secondary that really stepped up. What they did against Jalen Waddell, there were two plays down the field uh, where the DB made a hell of a play getting his hand in there late to knock it out. I know Jalen dropped a couple. But Skylar Thompson, while he went 18 of 45, okay, which is not good, did go for 220, and a touchdown. Uh, the, as far as the, the run game, you didn't give up a ton, but it seems to me like that Bills defense gives up big plays and big moments to keep people alive and in the game. If you would look at these numbers, all right, now I know Josh Allen turned the ball over a couple times. I saw that, which is kind of rarity. One of them really wasn't his fault. I, I mean, it's at the end of the day, sometimes it's just bang, bang like that. But it seems to me like when the Bills have a chance to put you away and step on your throat and kill you on defense, they don't do it. They don't do it. 
You let Miami just hang around and hang around. Then all of a sudden, first play of the second half, when you kick that field goal, get some momentum going in after letting them just stay in there and kick field goals, you get that sack fumble touchdown. Now they're up. Now you start getting nervous. And now you start forcing it. I'm having a hard time, and, and you know we put out a potential fraud alert with the Bills. I, I Offensively, look, Josh is going to, in big games, he's going to make plays with his legs down the field. Stephon Diggs needs to get in the end zone. All right, Dawson Knox was huge yesterday. I thought that second one was a touchdown. Mm-hmm. I thought that second catch was a touchdown. I didn't think the ground aided him. I, I'm just, I'm not going to ever worry about the Bills on offense. Cole Beasley, that was huge, him stepping up yesterday. It seemed like him and him and Josh were on the same page. I am just really worried about this Bills defense when it counts. I just don't trust them, Blaine. Well, I, think I'll, I don't think they played terrible. Right? I really don't think that. I just didn't really like the matchup against this Dolphins team, especially up front for the Bills on offense. Uh, the, the Dolphins D-line is nothing to mess around with. No, I know the Dolphins. These guys are elite up front on the D-line. They went and picked up Chubb. You got Phillips. You got Wilkinson. Like, these guys are elite, and you can, stall, you can see the Bills struggle up front. And I, what we go back, and I said on the Sunday show, Josh Allen is, ma- is making timely turnovers that we're not mm-hmm. used to seeing. Right? Even if he threw for 350-plus, I expect that from Josh Allen. But when I look at the Bills, who do the Bills always think about that? Who's getting over the hump for the Bills? It's the Chiefs, mm-hmm. right? And you can't make these mistakes against the Chiefs because Patrick Mahomes is not going to make these mistakes in the game that really matters in a championship game. So, Josh, you got to clean it up, especially in the red zone. I think they'll have a little bit more success coming in the next week. The defense, one thing I look about the defense, you have zero points in the fourth quarter. right? If you're the Bills, that's a great sign. Late in games, when it matters, you gave up zero points. Now for the Dolphins, Mike McDaniels. Those timeouts were the worst thing I've seen in a long time. You gotta delay time. a game on fourth and one when they reset the play. Reset clock. a long time. And I know sometimes, I know it's your first year. I know it's a little bit different. You're not used to being in this situation. Sometimes you're not gonna find the perfect play. Mm-hmm. You're not gonna find it. You have to get a play call out there and get it ran because that was absolutely almost malpractice to see as a head coach. Yep. You, you, you set your team up for failure. I thought Skyler played well. I really did. I thought he there's some passes out there that Jalen Waddle should have caught. Yeah. Right? He had a couple. Tyreek dropped a couple. But the thing about it, now if you're the Dolphins, down. right? Now you're the Dolphins. You have to find a way to keep this D-line together, keep this defense together. I thought Xavier Howard played a great game. Kid's an absolute stud, one of the best corners in the game. You have to find a quarterback. If Tua comes back, even if he comes back, you have to have a backup plan for this guy. Because I think you have a good enough roster, right, especially on, on both sides of the ball, to, to make a run for this stuff, guys. Because at the end of the day, you can stop the run, which they somewhat did. Devin Singletary had like 40-something yards. Josh Allen only had 20 yards on the ground, which is a win if you're playing against Josh Allen. But you have to find the missing piece of quarterback. Yeah, well, the, the Dolphins sacked the Bills seven times. Yeah. <laughs> they sacked him seven times. Josh Allen... The deep ball interception by Xavier Howard where the wide receiver broke off the route, that ain't on Josh to me. Mm-hmm. Both of those interceptions, in my opinion, weren't on Josh. The other one, the guy got his hand yeah. in there late. Bang, bang, ball tips up in the air. But here is what is on Josh. Tuck the ball away, man. You got to start tucking the ball. I understand reaching out for a first down late like Mahomes and you do. Uh, you fumbled it on the first drive, first or second drive, I believe, on third down to make it fourth down. And then in the pocket, when, you, when you're going down and there's three guys draped on you, and I've watched Josh Allen break tackles and, and situations like that, but when it's you know you're going down, tuck the ball away. I mean, he, he, I get you're competitive. I get you want to spin out of everything and go take off and run and go make a play, but tuck the ball away. But when it comes down, Blaine, to that, that fourth and one, here's what Mike McDaniel said. He said, there was some communication that we had gotten the first down. So then we were deploying a group of players for the first and 10 call. Then it was articulated that no, it was fourth down. I had gotten convicted information that it was a first down. I don't really know exactly who it was from. It's probably the first time all year that happened. You try to do your best. What do you mean you don't know who it was from? Yeah, and even, even if you take that one play away, Blaine's right. There were several clock mismanagement mm. issues towards the end that you have to put on Mike McDaniel. But to me, that only offset what had been a superior game plan performance by him. I think mm. for the rest of the game, Mike McDaniel went in and once again out game plan Sean McDermott. I mean, he really did. There, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a handful of guys, game planners in the country, who could go in and put up three 
31 points on the road against Buffalo Skyler with your Thompson. with your third string rookie quarterback Skylar Thompson mm-hmm. and Mike McDaniel did that. Reports did break yesterday that Tua is expected back to be the starting quarterback in Miami uh, next season. We're going to keep up with that and yeah. see exactly yeah. because they need it because like Jake says, the best ability is availability. They need a plan for even if he does come back but is hurt. Now on the offensive side, when you say um, you're never worried about Buffalo on the offensive end moving forward, I do agree with Blaine to an extent that Josh Allen is turning the football over more and more this season. And to me, it comes in, and we're about to get into the Giants. The missing piece to me is Brian Dable. You know, he was the OC in Buffalo for Josh Allen's entire career. Look what he's been able to do with Daniel Jones in the game that we're about to preview. So I'm interested moving forward here as it becomes more and more of a shootout necessity in the AFC when you go and play the Bengals or you go and play the Chiefs. And 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 Josh Allen already has this gunslinger mentality because he is one of the few individuals on the planet who can literally make every throw in Alien. the world. Like is he going to start to, you know, will we see another two, three, you know, multiple interception game in the divisional round or in the conference round? Yeah, I, again, we all talk about turnovers as the great equalizer. Mm-hmm. They're the great equalizer. And speaking about game plans, man, if you're feeling a little less like your old self these days, don't have the energy you used to or the body, well, do something about it with Nugenix Total T Testosterone Booster. If you text Crane, that's C-R-A-I-N, hey, that's my last name, to 231-231 for a complimentary bottle of Nugenix Total T. Text now, and you'll also get a complimentary bottle of Nugenix Thermo, their most powerful fat incinerator ever, absolutely free. Text C-R-A-I-N to 231-231, that's C-R-A-I-N, or c Rain, like me on the basketball court, to 231-231. Guys, unlike other products that use generic ingredients, which are far less clinical grade, Nugenix Total T gives you the same clinical potency levels used in trials. You want to hit home runs? I do. You want to jump up and make big catches like Justin Jefferson? Kind of. Go ahead and get you some Nugenics Total Tea, <laughs> and welcome to the show. It's just everybody look at each other. Kind of want to cock back like John Morant, too. We'll get to that. Oh, no, we're going to get to that. Bit. Oh, my aliens. goodness. Again, how many kids can this guy have? I mean, how many adoptions? I mean, what he's basically <laughs> Total Tea, baby. He should just put Total Tea on his jersey. It's, now. Uh, again, I, if, if I be able to jump like that, I'll take four pills a day of it. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's go to this last game before we go to the Booster Club. The, the, the New York football giants, boys. Producer Justine and they're texting us like she called it, you know. Yeah. She was, she was a believer, though. She no, was a believer. It's, again, I mean, Blaine, I think. Well, yeah, who else called it? Yeah, but Blaine took him to win. Yeah, I had him no plus credit. three and a half. There was a lot of belief. But he, here's, the real que- here's the, the real thing for me. And I know we're going to get to Kirk Cousins. All right, I know we're going to do that. I know we're going to do that. But I just want to say, the quarterback story of that game was not Kirk Cousins. The quarterback story of that game was Daniel Jones going 24-35 for 301 yards, two touchdowns, did get sacked three times. He had 17 rushes for 78 yards. But his decision-making is elite right Mm -hmm. now. And it's not just the plays where he takes off and runs for the first down. It's not just the plays where, you know, he's able to bide time and find Darius Slayton over the middle or Richie James or any of these guys. The smart football plays that Daniel Jones is making, if you really know the game and you watch, I'll give you a great example. Last drive they have, they're trying to milk the clock before they give it back to the Vikings to try and, you know, stop and win the game. Daniel Jones on second down, he realizes the Vikings have one timeout left. On second down, they drop back to throw it off a play action. First read isn't there. Daniel Jones feels the pressure. I think it was Daniil Hunter. Looks to throw the ball away, and it's like he realized, no. I am going to take a five-yard sack. You want to know why? Because then they have to burn that last time out. clock kept moving. It It is being prepared for every situation. We talk about it in baseball all the time. Before every pitch, what am I going to do when the ball is hit to me? But there's so much more going on in football. But from a knowing when to throw it away situation, from knowing when to take off, not just design runs, which, by the way, they had one drive where I swear they ran it more than Justin Fields. But Daniel Jones, to me, it looks like the game has slowed down and his decision-making process in a positive way has sped up. And we talk about gritty, right? I think that was the word we used on the Sunday preview show, gritty. The Giants are a gritty football team that finds a way to win games. The defense did not give up double digits in any quarter after the Vikings went straight down the field on that first drive like it was nothing, like Justin Jefferson was going to be wide open and scored that touchdown. Now for the Vikings. Kirk Cousins 
cannot check that ball down on fourth and seven with the season online. There's no excuse. I don't care if there's five guys just uh, guarding Justin Jefferson because I watched Justin Jefferson catch a fourth and 18 pass with three guys draped on him with one hand. That is inexcusable by Kirk Cousins. But Kirk Cousins is not the reason that they lost that game. Mm -hmm. The reason that they lost that game is that Ed Donatel and that defense has been absolute hot dog water since I can remember. And the Giants shredded them up and down the field pretty much consistently. Pretty much consistently. Whether it was in the quarterback run game, whether it was Saquon uh, busting, busting runs and catching passes and making plays, whether it was guys over the middle in the seam, whether it was Richie James being able to get the ball yards after catch, uh, get nine yards. It seemed like every third down they converted that was over five yards. The Vikings' defense was their biggest weakness. And Kirk Cousins, it's low-hanging fruit, and it's easy, and he does not make it easy on guys like me trying to defend him. And it is inexcusable. But I do not want the quarterback story from that game to be Kirk Cousins. It is Daniel Jones yep. and the, the escalation of his game and the elevation of his game in large part due to Brian Dayball. Yeah, exactly, and that's what I was gonna say. Once again, we come back to Brian Dayball. That's why it's so imperative for these quarterbacks around the league to play for coaches who can develop talent. You take someone like Michael Vick, he can play for any offensive coordinator or head coach in the world. He's still gonna put up you know, plays that make Sports Center top 10. But for a lot of these guys, like Daniel Jones is one year away under the wrong tutelage from being you know, traded in a backup somewhere. Now, I don't know what the future answer is long-term for the New York Giants at quarterback. Maybe it's Daniel Jones. Maybe Maybe it's not, but I know the future answer at head coach is Brian Dable because he's proven time and time again that he can get the most out of these quarterbacks. Going back to being the OC at Alabama with Jalen Hurts and Tua, going to his time in the Buffalo Bills with turning Josh Allen, like we just said, from a gunslinger into someone who knows when to take risk but also knows when not to. He's been able to get the most out of Daniel Jones. That showed yesterday. It was an incredible game plan. On the Kirk Cousins thing, Jake, I agree with you. I mean, Kirk Cousins, 31 of 39, 273 through the air, a pair of touchdowns, no interceptions, and all we're gonna think about and talk about is the check down at the end. Give your guy a chance, because just like we talked about Mike McDaniel, again, Kirk Cousins offset what was a really great game. Those numbers are fantastic, right? But to throw it underneath on, to check down on fourth and eight, especially when the defender is in between the tight end and the first down marker, it's not like you're throwing underneath to someone who's wide open who could go make a play. To go through your progressions and hit the guy you're supposed to in your progressions, that's fine for second and eight in the second quarter. That's the, that's the time for that. When you have to have a play, I'd rather throw into triple coverage to my guy yeah. and just see if he goes and makes an unbelievable and, play. And, and you know, the, the thing, Blaine, is Kirk Cousins, a lot of the reason he is where he is right now is not because of his unbelievable physical prowess or athleticism. It's because mentally he understands what to do in every play and he has the ability to get the ball there. Context matters. When you go back and look at that play, it's fourth down and eight. The play clock is about to run out. Kirk Cousins is screaming for the ball. And it's almost like he went into default mode. Like, give me the ball, here we go. Don't want it. It's kind of a late snap, crazy situation. It's like he almost forgot it was fourth and eight. And I'm not making an excuse regardless. It's unacceptable. I don't care if there was no seconds on the play clock before he snapped it. But go ahead. Let's get this out of the way. Kirk Cousins will always Kirk Cousin at the end of the day. He will. There's no avoiding it. I'm not sitting here to say that Kirk played a bad game because he didn't. All right, what blew my mind is this. 11-0 and during the regular season in one possession game. 11-0. and But when you needed him the most, that drive you needed him the most, what did he do? He Kirk Cousined it, guys. Fourth and eight, you have Justin Jefferson. Yep. Top two receiver in the NFL. Hell, most of them, you can put him at one. There's a legitimate argument there. What do you do? You check it down to TJ Hawkinson. And what, this is the same guy. There's a reason Kirk Cousins is one and four in the playoffs. And his one win was against the Saints. And oh boy, won that game. Yeah, he had he threw one up at the end. Yeah, oh boy, won that game. I will sit here and say it. First of all, the Vikings defense is terrible. Ter we're, and we're not surprised by this. No. We're, worst passing defense in the NFL. Well, we've been talking about Yeah, it. worst That's passing defense. And, but years. at the end of the day, Kirk Cousins is going to Kirk Cousins, guys. This is not surprising to anybody. And I'm not sitting here saying Kirk's a bad quarterback. He's upper mid. Right? That's what he is. He's an upper mid quarterback. He will never, and I repeat, 100%, you can put it on my gravestone, win a Super Bowl. He won't. He won't. And don't care what you put around him. 
He will not. He will find a way to blow it at the end of the game. Kirk Cousins is the Longmire of the NFL. If you've ever seen the show Longmire, which is a fantastic show, I like it on Netflix. It's upper mid, all right? <laughs> Storylines are pretty good. The acting's pretty good. It's not going to, you know, it, it beat, beat out Breaking Bad you know, or anything like that, but it's a good show. It's a good show. Let me say this about the Giants real quick. Daniel Jones is your future. For sure. Daniel yeah. Jones is your guy. He's I don't know it. what else the kid has to do. He damn near played a perfect game. Yeah. I mean, threw for three bills, ran for 80 yards. I mean, other than Brock Purdy, name another guy in the first playoff game who's been who played better than him. I mean, and what was the knock on Daniel Jones? Turnovers. Yeah. Turnovers. The kid's not doing it. And a, a huge, two reasons. You brought it up. Coach Dayball, right? And Saquon Barkley yep. looks like Saquon Barkley. Saquon is one of the nastiest runners of the football in the league. He spun a guy yesterday, and I almost threw up. Yeah, sitting in poor my Harrison chairs. Smith. Oh right. God! <laughs> oh, could you be imagine being a safety and being a white safety in the league and seeing Saquon run at you? Not a good situation. Damn it! What do yeah. you do? Help! Fake a heart attack. I don't know. You're not going to tackle him. But if the Giants are running the ball, what I say about their front seven? Gritty. They get after it. They have a really extremely good defense. Dexter line. Lawrence. Dexter is Lawrence. A problem. Well, uh, uh, Williams. You got Thibodeau. You have, I think, Jalen Smith, a middle linebacker, who's yeah. just walking on freaking out every play. Yeah. And you got some young guys in the back end who are pretty good. The Giants are young. And it's one of those teams where you put them in the playoffs. It's like they don't even know where they are. They're, they're not scared to mess up. They're just out there playing football. I watch the Giants. They're having fun and they're just playing football. And that's a direct correlation to what? The head coach. Well, when you when you know who you are, and the coaches know who you are, mm -hmm. and you guys are on the same page, and you know we, we we talked about playing in the strengths earlier with the Ravens and kind of their mindset. I, I think the Giants just do a really good job. That staff does a really good job of putting guys in position. And when you have when you and I know it's not the perfect situation for Kenny Galladay over there after what when they got him last year and he's supposed to be this big time player. But you know what I'm watching him do. I'm watching him block his ass off out in the perimeter. Mm -hmm. I'm watching him do the little dirty things. People say, oh, well, he better do something with what we're paying him. Yeah, but but how many wide receivers that are getting paid that money are going out there doing that? I think it shows you the culture in that locker room because you got a lot of guys that have been doubted at the same time, right? Daniel Jones, oh, he'll never be able to do it. He's overrated. He's a yeah. boss. Saquon Barkley, always oh, injury prone. He's never going to be back to the Saquon that we've that, that we've seen. Darius Slayton, oh, he's fast. You know, but he's he's not an elite wide receiver that can do these things. Richie James, not a household name in the slot that you're really going to trust, whatever. I, I just think you got a bunch of guys that are talented, that have been kind of counted out mm -hmm. and are a little bit underrated, and they're all pissed off for greatness together. Yeah. That's a real thing. Um, and, Blaine, I hear you on Daniel Jones being the future of the Giants, and I don't necessarily disagree, but I will come back to the point that the difference between success and failure a lot of times is based on expectations, right? And that's a thing with Kirk Cousins is the reason we call him mid is because the expectation for the Vikings the last few years is this is a Super Bowl caliber team mm -hmm. and they've and they've and they've underachieved on that. You look at someone like the Seahawks, supposed to be one of the worst teams in the NFL this year. Geno Smith comes out, breaks a single season yardage record, overperformed. Now he's still out in the first round of the playoffs, but overperformed by expectations. Same with Daniel Jones and the Giants, I think, for the point that you just mm -hmm. made. Not supposed to be that great this year. Daniel Jones probably is last year in New York, right? Who knows if Saquon Barkley is going to be healthy? So when you overperform like this, you've overexceeded yeah. the expectations. What happens when those Giants' expectations become what the Vikings have been for the last few years? And as tough as it is for Vikings fans right now, they wake up here after a wild card loss when they were supposed to have a Super Bowl contending team. I know that it hurts, and I know it hurts even more to know that Kirk Cousins is probably not the guy to win you a Super Bowl. I'll tell you what, it still beats having chaos at the quarterback position because a lot of franchises yeah. have that. And Well, there's an old saying, it's a, lot, <laughs> it's a lot harder to overcome prosperity than adversity. There you go. And I think that's the, the expectation. Well, I'll say this about right. Daniel Jones. All right, let's I mean, the booster club here. Yeah, I'll say this about Daniel Jones. I mean, you need to surround him with some talent. You know what I'm saying? Sure. He, he's not surrounded with the talent like Kirk Cousins. Yeah, but you got to make sure you bring in the right guy that's not going to sure. in there for and sure. up that For sure. But let me go through these receivers for you guys. Isaiah Hodgins. Who's balling right now? Who's that guy? Yeah. Who's that guy? No yeah. one knows. Only reason I know Darius Slayton because he played at Auburn. Yeah. It's the only reason I know that. Then you go Saquon. Richie James. Who's that guy? These are just, these are somewhat nobodies coming out and balling right now. Mm -hmm. So once you get some real, and I'm not used to the Giants not having extreme talent on wide receiver. Me growing up, they always had a couple guys. Yeah. But again, if they had Odell Beckham Jr., who we do all know, would it be better right now or would it be worse? Mm, I think it'd be better if Odell's on the field. 
I mean, possibly. I mean, it depends on the Odell. But in the is it better on Odell? the field, but maybe are, are worse it, in the locker room? Or is it kicking, is it kicking field goal nets, Odell? Is it no, new Odell kind of grown up? Is it Rams Odell? That's the question. Or is it kicking, you That's know, what I'm asking. Odell is it? All right, let's get to the Boucher Club. Let's go to Jimbo Fisher. I believe you had a, do- a donation. What's up, Jimbo? $10 donation. Appreciate it, my guy. He says, how about my G-man, Brian Dayball, is without question. Coach of the year now, right? Him and Ducky P. Well, it's funny. Everybody keeps talking about Kirby Smart and him being a Nick Saban protege and all he's done. Brian Tables won, too. Mm-hmm. Like, he's doing it in the league right now. I mean, it's it's unbelievably impressive. Says, so especially after we defeated uh, the hashtag boat, cur- uh, boat Curse. Also, y'all saw us trolling the Vikings Twitter account, right? Epic night. Yeah, uh, <laughs> they put Skull with a big L at the end. Gotcha. Yeah, which I, I, I love the trolling from the, uh, the social media uh, groups. Okay, let's go to uh, Matty Ice. said, I predicted Niners and Bengals Super Bowl around week 10. Really haven't talked about the Niners that much. I mean, right now, if you're the Niners, guys, you got to be feeling pretty good about a lot of things. Yeah, you're handling business. Go look at the difference in the numbers between Jimmy Garoppolo and Brock Purdy in the playoffs, just even right now. It mm-hmm. will blow your mind. It will, I know there's a bigger sample size with Jimmy G, but speaking about the future, I don't know how Brock Purdy in the future of the 49ers. Got to be. Got to be. All right. Let's go to Justin Reagan. He said, I can see the Vikings drafting a guy like Hendon Hooker to probably replace the upper mid Kirk Cousins. Well, to, to, in my opinion, you can get some really good value for Kirk Cousins if you were to move him somewhere. Somebody will take Kirk Cousins and, get, and, get, and pay you handsomely for it. You just got to find the right place. That's why I'm very interested to see how the C.J. Stroud situation with the draft works out because that could take that Bears pick from a really nice situation to an elite situation if C.J. Stroud stays in college, which I don't believe, but the deadline's at the end of today, so you better, better you know, do it or get off the pot. <laughs> okay, let's go to Sister Riggs. What's up, Sister Riggs? I can already feel the hate for Kirk, our hate for Kirk Cousins coming together, <laughs> which is awesome. She says, T.L. can't throw four interceptions in those Trevor Lawrence next weekend and win against the Chief, no. Chiefs, but I hope he's past that now. The Jags turned the ball over five times. The Chargers turned the ball over zero times, and the Jags won. You figure that out because mm. I don't know. Wow. Okay, let's go to Blake the Great. What's up, Blake? Cone, what will the 49ers do with Trey Lance? That's a good question. I mean, you have to move him at this point, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think because Trey Lance is so young, you're not going to keep him as the backup for Brock Purdy. And again, let's see how this the, the rest of the postseason plays out for Brock Purdy. But I was starting, I was driving in today, I was starting to get some serious Tom Brady in New England type vibes. Now, not because of, of Tom Brady's greatness necessarily, just because of the situation. Remember, I mean, the Patriots, the Patriots had an answer at quarterback uh, with a uh, um, who was a Patriots quarterback? Drew Bledsoe. Uh, Drew, with Drew Bledsoe, right? They had that taken care of. You draft Tom Brady late in the sixth round, something like that, and he not expected to do too much. An injury propels him into the starting lineup and never relinquishes it, mm-hmm. right? That's what I'm saying could be a situation here with Brock Purdy because the 49ers, to me, didn't... We, we were already talking about what's their long-term answer at quarterback. I never thought it was Jimmy Garoppolo, and I don't think we've had a lo- lar- large enough sample size with Trey Lance. Yeah, it, it, again, you know, Trey is... You know about the injury and it's tough, but right now I just don't know how. And look, the, the owner doesn't have to explain anything to anybody, and GM, you know, doesn't really have to explain anything to the fans. But if the Niners, especially if they win this game, how in the hell do you look your fan base or the people that buy the tickets in the eyes and say, "Well, you know, Brock Purdy's not our guy." Mm-hmm. I, I just, I just don't know how. And you know what? It's a great situation to be in because old boys come on the scene and he belongs. And there's just something about being a four-year starter in college or a three-year starter in college. The game, it's a different, same sport, different game in NFL and college. But Brock Purdy, the game does not look too fast for him. And I know he's in a, he stepped into a great situation. He did step into a great, about the best situation you can step into as a rookie quarterback. So I, again, I, I think him and Daniel Jones, there's so many good young quarterbacks in the league, just like there's a lot of good young quarterbacks in the booster club. And we're three minutes away from taking some calls, boys. And before that, let's preview uh, Dallas at Tampa Bay tonight. Yeah. Uh, Here's my here's the way I feel about this game. And I'm not going to look at what the Buccaneers did to the, the Cowboys four months ago. You're not? Right? That that's, it's, has no bearing on this game. I'm going to roll with the Cowboys tonight. Mm-hmm. I'm going to roll with the Cowboys tonight. And I believe I, it's more so because of the defense. And it's more so because I don't think that the Buccaneers – are going to be able to consistently drive the ball down the field without Tom Brady having to throw it all over the yard the whole night. I don't think they can line up and run it right at the Cowboys and have success. Not that Tom won't find some prosperity through the air, but I feel like there's a couple turnovers. I feel like the Cowboys get a touchdown on defense, maybe one on special teams, and, and just some part of me 
thinks that CeeDee Lamb is going to freak out tonight. Mm. Just have one of those humongous games. I just don't trust the Buccaneers' consistency on offense. I know the defense has done a good job of keeping them in games. And I know that when Dak turns it over, it's catastrophic. It's not just a normal turnover. It's a strip sack fumble for a touchdown, a pick six where he just tossed it to the guy, or a terrible decision on third and long with the game on the line. But I just, pardon me, my instinct, the spidey senses are telling me the Cowboys win this game tonight, even though they're going up against the GOAT, Tom Brady. Blaine, what do you think? Okay, I just want you to remember now, all right, you bet me that the Vikings go further than the Cowboys in the playoffs. Yeah, well, again, we'll play the game tonight, but I, when I bet you that, the situation was a little I don't know what the bet was. Now. I can't even remember. I like the Cowboys in this game. No. One reason is the offensive line for the Bucs is terrible. It's not good. Been bad all year. Been banged up all year. What's the strong, what's the strong suit for the Cowboys? D-line. This D-line. Demarcus Lawrence. Michael Parsons. Then they got depth. I've seen the back end. They're not good. The Cowboys are not good in the secondary. You have digs. Other than that, they're a bunch of liabilities walking around. What's the situation with Van Der Esch? Do we know if he's coming out there and playing? Uh, let me look it up real okay. quick. If he's back there, I feel like that fixes a lot of things in the box for the Cowboys. I think Dak's going to have a good game. I also do think CD's going to freak out. I do think Tom's going to play well because it's, it's playoff Tom Brady. That's what I think. But I think at the end of the day, the Cowboys have more talent on both sides of the ball. Ball. I think Mike McCarthy needs this one. All right, I really is do. Is he fired if they if lose this game? If he loses this game? game, he's gone. I think he's fired. And if I think he loses Sean game, Payton he is, is waiting gone. on this. I agree with that. I feel Sean Payton's the hottest girl, girl in the school right now. Yeah. All right? Around the league, is the hottest chick they've seen for a while. So I like the Cowboys. I think it's going to be close. All right, I think it's going to be close, but I like the Cowboys. I would say, you know, a field goal, maybe three to five. I'd play it there. But Dak Prescott, I think he's going to have a good game. All right, I, I got the injury report right here, David. What's it uh, say? I got it pulled up. Well, if this computer will work and let me scroll down, then I would love okay, to. Okay, I got it right here. Um, yeah, I believe he's out there right now. The only person on the injury report for the Cowboys is Trevon Mullen. He is a cornerback. Um, so we have five questionable guys on the Bucks. Questionable means you're probably playing. No. Um, Carlton Davis is third. War Eagle is cornerback. Keanu Neal, safety. Logan Ryan, safety. Uh, Vita Villa, he better play. He's he a monster. If he doesn't play, oh there's going to be a lot of hike. Zeke, Tony yeah. Pollard, go ahead and get it done. All right, appreciate that. I feel the same way. Uh, we're still waiting on this to get to get in here, but I feel the same way uh, about this game that I did about the Vikings and the Giants. You know, I just I, I didn't know. I feel like felt like the Vikings were were a better team all around than the Giants, and they had the advantage of playing at home. I feel the same way kind of about the Cowboys. They've proven to be a better team all around than the Buccaneers. The Tampa Bay inept on offense for most of the season, and yet somehow being at home with Tom Brady, I still feel like I shouldn't go against my gut. I I, I think I need to take Tampa Bay here to win the football game. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that's crazy betting on Tom Brady. All right, so now we're taking your calls, so make sure you call the number on the screen. We got it in the chat. It's on social media accounts and everything like that. Just queue it up when you're ready, Coney. Um, yeah, not ready just yet. So what I want to do is I want to talk about... Um, hold on, I just want to preview one thing here real quick because we have Jacksonville going to uh, Kansas City, which mm -hmm. is the four versus the one seed. Um, just give me your thoughts on that right now. Well, I, I just... I, I don't trust... Trevor Lawrence them not to turn the ball over. And if you do that once or twice against the Chiefs, I know that the Jaguars' defensive line has been really good. The front seven has been pretty good against the run. But when it comes down to the secondary, they got one of the worst ones in the league. I mean, now you're gonna now you're gonna go out here against Patrick Mahomes and the rest of the aliens and witches that are running around uh, for the Chiefs and, and thinking you're gonna go to Arrowhead and, and they're gonna somehow keep you in the game. I just I, I don't see it happening. I don't think the Jags are gonna be able to maintain it. I'm interested to see how this Chiefs defense responds. Uh, to be honest with you, David, but I I believe the spread opened to eight and a half, something like yeah, that. Yeah, right. Kansas City. Uh, I don't know what the over under is right now. One and a half. Teams. Uh, pretty big. But, yeah. Blaine, let's go back to the Booster Club. Bro. Okay, let's go. We have a donation from Justin Reagan. What's up, my brother? He says, $2 donation. He says, Chargers front office had to call Sean Payton so fast after that horrendous game. I'm surprised the guy still has a job. Yeah, I'm shocked. Uh, I, I'm shocked. I, I tweeted right after the game. There's no way after the last two years, after the decision-making at the end of the year this season and, and some of the in-game stuff, that Brandon Staley is your guy. And there was one moment in that game where I think it showed you the lack of respect that a lot of Chargers players have for their head coach. When Bosa came off on the sidelines and slammed his helmet, Brandon Staley, the head coach, picked it up and handed it back to him. He grabbed it, looked at him, and slammed it down in the ground again because uh, Staley was trying to prevent a penalty. That's what he was trying to do. I think it just shows you a lack of respect for the head coach. I just, I don't think he's the guy. I just, you either got it or you don't, and he doesn't have it in, in big moments. He just doesn't. Uh, I don't put that on Justin Herbert. You don't kick the field goal to 36, which would have been a 53-yarder after Casey Dicker uh, had just smashed a 50-yarder that had at least 10 more yards on it that would have been good. I just think the guy's decision-making is poor, and he doesn't have a ton of respect from the players. That's just what I believe. 
All right, let's go to Charles Moore. What's up, Charles? As a Cowboys fan, I'm excited that Jake has the faith. He appreciates that. Also, a Cowboys fan with a grip on reality. I took the Bucks money line for my Smart. booster. Head, to, <laughs> yeah. head your emotions, that's buddy. Like, that's what you need. Who to did that? That's uh, Charles Moore. Charles, yeah, that's very smart. Head your emotions. All right, let's go to Kyle win. Kenny. What's up, gal? Yeah. Um, Peyton isn't going to Dallas. Jerry won't give up control that Peyton will require. I'll say this. How bad do you want to win, Jerry Jones? Well, it's uh, okay. I mean, it's, I, again, when you're looking at Jerry Jones, trying to guess what he's going to do, I, I think it's a little bit frivolous, even though he has given us a pattern uh, of stubbornness and instability since he won those two Super Bowls with Jimmy Johnson. You know, I, I feel like at some point, at some point, and Sean Peyton gets this, that the star is such a big brand that you can take a little bit. I, I think Sean Payton would give a little bit of leeway, not to not have full control, but let Jerry do his interviews, let him do his thing in the media and stuff like that. Uh, I, I just, I just believe that the Cowboys brand is that big. I, I just think it's that. I don't want to go out to the Chargers with, with the curse that's been going on out there. If I'm Sean Payton, even though it is LA, uh, I feel like the Cowboys and Sean Payton would be a great fit. I think the biggest question is if the Cowboys win this game and then lose the next one, does Mike McCarthy get fired? I think if they lose this one, he's going to get fired. The question is. Will he get fired uh, if they lose the second playoff game, if they make it past the first? Um, so the team so, uh, the team is sending in some calls right now, but I want to get to some rapid-fire items real quick first okay. before we do that. All right, so 11 ranked basketball teams lost this Saturday, Ooh. which tied an AP yep. poll era record. Two more lost on Sunday. All in all, Tennessee, Arizona, Kansas State, Iowa State, Arkansas, Miami, Wisconsin, Providence, Missouri, San Diego State, Duke, UConn and Marquette all fell. Yeah, college basketball, man. College basketball, it's why, it's why it's so hard to bet. Now, the UConn game, and I know they're 4-4 four and four in the Big East right now, that one surprised me. Losing to St. John's the way they did. They lost a 4-5, or five, I yeah, think. Yeah, and you look at kind of Creighton, they've been up and down the Big East, as they just beat each other up, whether it's Providence, Marquette, I can, that had a hell of a game against Xavier, I can go down the list. Uh, it's just, it's part of it. You're going to see this sometimes. We saw a bunch of weekends last year where it was just absolutely wild. Um, you know, again, I really, really believe deep down that Alabama is obviously a top four team, but that Houston is the best team in college basketball. I, I really believe that. Purdue and Zach Eady, who's roaming some, you know, mountain in the Himalayas right now, getting ready for the next game, I don't know if they have enough around him without Ivy. But, man, the more I watch college basketball, the more I think that this transfer portal has had a humongous effect on parity in the game. We've One of the greatest parts about college basketball in the NCAA tournament is the parity, right? That's what we love the most. We love the parity the most. But, but this year, it just seems a little bit different, doesn't it? Am I just... Am I crazy? Like, I'm looking at Texas Tech and how they're playing, how they're struggling. I think they're, what, 0-5 in the Big 12? There is not a night off in these big-time conferences. There's not a night off in the SEC. Now, I guess you could say the ACC, maybe Florida State and Louisville, which, in my opinion, have been the two biggest disappointments out of, out of anybody. But, David, I mean, we're going to continue to see this. I watched Alabama beating LSU 44-14. to Then two hours later, I'm watching Texas A&M Beat South Carolina, beating South Carolina 44 to 14, that just beat Kentucky on the road, who just beat Tennessee on the road hours before. The, I don't know, David. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. At the, at the end of the day, I think this college basketball season, will this be one where we get a George Mason in the Final Four? But which team is that gonna be? That's the question. That's the question I, I have to ask. Is it Jelly Walker and UAB? Which, by the way, and I'd love to love to hear an answer in the comments. Is Alabama the most underrated basketball state in the country right now? Got look, some great teams. I mean, look at Alabama. Mm -hmm. Look at Auburn. Look at UAB. I mean, typically South Alabama's pretty good too. North Alabama's typically pretty good. Made the NCAA tournament a couple years ago, if I'm not mistaken. But I am loving what I'm seeing in college basketball right now, Blaine. You know, I agree. And I watched in Alabama, man. They're going to be a tough team to stop. But this is a tournament I am so ready for, guys. So ready for it. I mean, you think about this right now. I mean, you go down. I mean, Duke's at 24. You know, that's the last thing I would realistic. I know it's Coach K first season out, but they have extremely good talent. And this Kansas team, man, there's something about this Kansas team. First of all, they got Haru on the team. who's Jalen Wilson is a monster. But who's an absolute problem. They return talent. And still, I think North Carolina is going to obviously be there at the end of the day. I'm, I'm so confused about this North Carolina team. 
because they really didn't lose much. No. I mean, what did they lose? No. What has changed? You didn't lose Leaky Black. You no. You didn't lose Caleb. You lost Brady Mannix down low. True. The guy who looks like he was hanging out with the Unabomber for mm -hmm. a while. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, you know, outside of that, you got Baycott coming back. Who, I mean, hell, you're just hoping to get through the game without him falling through the floor <laughs> in, in the NCAA tournament. But I will say this. I feel like this is one of those teams, they're veteran, they're not going to panic, right? They're, they're, the, the North Carolina players are not going to panic. You're not going to see, you know, uh, RJ and those guys freak out over oh, terrible. Don't let these guys get hot late. Don't let them get hot late because they'll make another run. But as much as I love Kansas, I want to go back to Houston and Sasser and those guys. But Grady Dick from Kansas, talking about Haru, the great white ninja, yes. is absolutely a cold-blooded killer, David. Yeah. He is a cold-blooded killer. Killer. I mean, he looks, you know what he looks like? He looks like he's about to show up at your doorstep, yeah. <laughs> take your daughter to prom, he's gonna yeah. treat her right, not make any moves, not drink or put her in any bad situations. And then also, he's gonna go drop 33 against Texas. Yeah, and then help out on the food drive. And then help out on the food you drive, know? give blood the next day, walk an old lady across the street, and go visit a dog shelter. Uh, talking about college basketball, more serious issue here. Alabama basketball player Darius Miles was arrested. He was among two yeah. men yesterday arrested yeah. on capital murder charge from a shooting that happened on the strip in Tuscaloosa this weekend. Th that's all the details that I have right now. It was a young woman who was shot. I think she was 23 years old. Horrible uh, situation. An awful situation. Young mother, and, and, and I got some information from somebody that I trust that is very close to the situation. I don't believe that Darius and I'm not saying this makes anything right, I don't think Darius Miles, who was the Alabama player, was the shooter. I believe he was with the shooter and it was his gun. Because I think there were some other players around who tried to go help the girl when, when, when it happened. Um, it's an awful situation. This is why you just, you know, and it's, it's, it's horrible, obviously, because she, number one, she was a mother as well, had, had a young child, I believe. But you're a, you're a guy that, in Darius Miles that, that made it out of a tough home life. You made it out. You've got a chance now to flip the script on everything that everybody thought was gonna happen to you with where you're from and, and your situation, socioeconomic or whatever. And you find yourself in this situation. This just goes to show you, and for all the young people out there, guilt by association's a real thing and you are, you are what you eat, okay? You are who you hang out with. All right, and the, it was a friend of his that I don't believe was on the team that, that shot this poor woman, basically in, in cold blood, I believe. It is an awful situation. And uh, I, I was shocked when I saw this. Yeah, I was too. shocked when I saw it. Me too. Absolutely shocked. I mean, I mean, what, I mean, what can you really say? I mean, yeah, you're an idiot. Yeah, I mean, you are, and truth. you are. I'm, I'm not coming there trying to be an asshole or anything like that, but you are an idiot and you deserve to go to jail. I mean, you are never, I don't care if you're Cam Newton, I mean, Tim Tim, you are never, you are not as big as you think you are, buddy. You're not just going to run around here and get away. Look, I lived in Alabama for two years on the strip. I know what goes down right there. It don't matter if you're a football player, basketball player, you're not above the law. You don't get to run around and do anything you want. This was absolutely disgusting on every level. And how you get to the point, first of all, where are your friends at? Who are your friends other than this guy? Where are the guys on the team at? Where are the leaders on the team at? It's the same damn thing with Henry Ruggs, who got in that car at 2 in the morning and went 150 miles per hour down the highway. Who are your friends? At the end of the day, they're not your friends. Well, like, if you don't have the guys willing to come out and call you to get in front of your face, have to fight you if they have to, to stop you from doing something that's going to ruin your life. Yeah, well, we, we say this about a ton of things, not just, you know, these, these tragic murders that happen, but like Deshaun Watson or... or are some of these people like, do you, do your friend like my friends would be like, stop. What, oh, what they would doing? never get to this point. Yeah, like what what are you doing? Like, did anybody ever look at that's what happens when you just when when you never get told no. Or you, you get whatever you want, you you think you're on a level that you're not, and nobody is really on that level outside of the Clintons. But you know, at, at the end of the day, it is a horrible, <laughs> tragic situation. I'll tell you what isn't a tragic situation, David. I'm so excited about the new Collins. I jumped a shark by like 15 minutes. That's fine. That's how excited That's I am. That's fine. Hey. All right. Don't apologize. No, no. I'm not apologizing. I'm choosing violence right Don't now. Don't apologize. Bro, is anybody else hot in here? Huh? Is it just me? It may just be Dude, you. Dude, I am a thousand degrees over here. Really? You're a little Wayne? I don't know what's <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but I'm sweating <laughs> over you here. You nervy? Nervy? I never get nervy. I don't know. Well, you we, look nervy. 
We are about to take our first call. Last two things, though, real quick. Yeah. The Padres signed a 16-year-old Ethan <laughs> Salas of Venezuela yeah. Yeah. on the first day of International Signing Day. I, get, I think every person in this kid's family has played professional baseball in some level. Yeah, if you think, if you think this <laughs> That's kid, what it said. Oh, this God. kid's probably really 13. Like, he's, he's yeah. no high way 12, really green 16. crown. Look, imagine, imagine somebody coming up to you as 16 years old. I remember myself playing baseball 16 years old. And they're like, hey, man, we just uh, want to go ahead and give you 6 million bucks. You're that good. Like what's that? What's that? What's that one song? Like ain't can't nobody tell me nothing. That that's uh, the the old highway road or whatever that song is with uh uh you know horses in the back whatever. This is great great for him. You know great for him. The Padres they believe obviously they believe. I mean if you look, uh, he's the younger brother of Jose Salas, one of the top prospects in the Miami Marlins system. Apparently Uh, the Salas brothers can smash the potato. His whole family. Yeah. His whole apple didn't fall far. Yeah, that's like I was watching this. I was watching Dalvin and uh, Dalvin and James run. Oops. I was like, yeah. I was like, how fast? You run you? the same. I was like, I was, what does your dad look like? Yeah, how fast is your dad? For both y'all to first of all, they run the exact same, the exact same. It's just, it's always fun to see like brothers or cousins or something like that compete in the same sport. Can you just see the genetics flow through? Right, you can just see it passed on. And if you're 16, he's from Venezuela, right? I believe. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's funny. On that same note, also on Sunday, the Nationals signed outfielder Elian Soto, the 17-year-old brother of Padres right fielder, Juan Soto. There you go. Again, just keep keep if pumping them out, man. Soto, you can smash. Yeah, yeah, it's like right when you leave the hospital in Caracas, like you're hitting like sunflower seeds with a little bat, like a little toddler. Last one, just to keep an eye on, a welterweight trilogy title fight between yeah. Leon Edwards and Kamaro Usman will headline UFC 286 on March 18th in London. Trilogy Who do I got to watch Usman kill again? Yeah. He lost to Leon Edwards last time. Well, we'll see this time. Yeah. yeah. We'll see this I'm time. I'm kind of more excited fight. about seeing that transgender body. I just wish Jake Paul would fight me, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I just wish Jake Paul and Blaine would fight. That's All right, you boys ready for a caller? And let's take Please. some calls. All right. Let's take some calls. Let's go to Becky in Topeka, Ooh. Kansas. Okay. Becky, we need you to set the tone for the entire week. What do you have for us? Ooh, that's a lot of pressure on a Monday it morning, is. but <laughs> it is. I will do my best. Um, I just had a quick question. I'm a big Kansas City Royals fan. Okay. Um, and so we got a new manager this year. We've got some young talent, so I'm excited about the direction of the team. I wondered what you guys thought. Obviously not playoff chances, but maybe the direction the team's headed in, as well as Kind of explain the business side to me because I don't understand how small market teams are supposed to compete in this climate with the signing of free agents and stuff like that. Like, how are the Royals supposed to year in and year out stay competitive? So, well, yeah, well, yeah, Becky, number one, thank you so much for the call. Uh, Love the state of Kansas. Been out there many times. Um, You know, I love I I love Coach Hoover, the bench uh, the bench coach they got. at the end of the day, when it comes to small market teams, and we keep seeing, it's it's almost like the arms race we see in college football and stuff like that. It seems like, you know, oh, well, the luxury tax and all this other stuff, we'll just pay the fine. I, I believe that there should be the same cap. I believe it should be an even cap in my opinion. I'm a guy that believes in meritocracy. So I'm right there with you. But the Royals have shown you the way that they've done it before because the climate when the Royals won the World Series, it was still moving up and the money was still crazy like this. So it's not different in that regard. But if you are a small market team, it almost feels like you can't go the route of I'm going to get two or three superstars and build this mega team. You almost have to go the route of the Milwaukee Bucks, right? Get your Giannis Antetokounmpo and build around him with a Chris Middleton and a Drew Holiday or somebody like that. But the Royals have tear. I've watched the Royals tear it down and build it back. It feels like, and I know Becky, you feel the same way more than just about anybody. But when I look to the future, I do like where they're going. And when it comes to competing, you have to make a ton of small good decisions that lead to big decisions. But when you talk about getting that big star or, or trying to maybe get that big star and then that Robin to the Batman. I think there are some young guys out there that they could make some moves for. Mm. But again, the Royals are still setting up for two or three years down the road. You've got the new coach. You've kind of got a new swagger a little bit. So uh, I love the ballpark as well. Been there twice, Becky. But I do like the future of the Royals. It just may take a little bit longer than what Royals fans want. But hell, y'all have waited Y'all waited longer than anybody before. So it really <laughs> shouldn't be a problem this time, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm excited about Bobby Witt. But yeah. you know, some of it makes me wonder... Do you trade him and get some more in return, you know, if you are building for down the road several years? So 
I would hate to see him waste his career in Kansas City as well as us waste his good years waiting to be good. Yeah, well, you sound like an Angels fan right now talking about Mike Trout and hopefully not Shohei <laughs> yeah. Otani in the future. Uh, but yeah, yeah, look, I, yeah, sometimes you do got to go all in on a guy and, and see if he can help take you to that promised land. The question is, how long do you stick with it? I, I don't dislike the plan. I like the plan. Uh, the patients need to be there. But how many times do you have to just start trading away assets to try and acquire more assets over time until you get caught in that vacuum and that cycle? You know that feeling. Like we're, we're looking around at some teams right now that keep getting caught in the cycle of, all right, we're going to try it. We're going to knock it down, rebuild it, try it this way. Oh, it didn't work. Knock it down, rebuild it, try it this way. Oh, it didn't work. You have kind of got to find that, that plan that works for you. I think the Royals are still somewhat searching for it, and hopefully they find it within the next couple of years. But, Becky, we really, really, really appreciate it. Stay safe out there. And, an, right, and another you, thing, thank you. And another thing the Royals have going for them is playing in the AL Central. That is you know, true. I mean, that is Guardians, true. White Sox, Twins, Tigers. I mean, is anybody really going to step up and sort of own I'm, that The Twins, I'm interested. I, the, the Twins are the one to me, mm -hmm. especially with Correa, if he can get that, that leg healthy. The Twins are, 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 are kind of an interesting one to yep. watch out for. Thanks again, Becky. Let's go to Randy. Randy's coming in from Michigan. Let's see what Ooh, this one's uh -oh. about. Gentlemen, how we doing this morning? Randy, what is up, up Randy? bro? Up my guy. Guys, I love the show. The sun is shining here in Michigan. We have mm, it like nice. five minutes so <laughs> far out of the year, so mm -hmm. it's fantastic. Listen, we wake up and choose violence. So you have to Randy, I'd love to hear love you say show. it on a Monday morning. <laughs> hey, uh, Randy, we appreciate you, buddy. Hey, I just wanted to ask your opinion. I know that it's off-season now, and, and Coney, this is more uh, directed to you being a Michigan man. You know, where are we at? Michigan football, are we better off without the drama of Harbaugh, even though he's had the success recently? I would say no. First of all, Randy, where in Michigan are you calling in from? Frankenmuth. Frankenmuth. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Sounds like, hey, well, <laughs> you got to get the boys up there and have a good time. Are, are the boys better off without Jim Harbaugh? Look, I think the I think Michigan will always be a fantastic football program, no matter who is at the helm. You know, give in, in the long run. But I will say, I had to live through the Rich Rodriguez era, and that was that was a tough time. Now Brady Hoke was hired afterwards. Brady Hoke rough. recruited me at Ball State. <laughs> yeah. Trust me when I tell you I love Brady Hoke as a man and as a football coach. I wanted him to have the utmost success. Michigan had a rare opportunity to be able to hire Jim Harbaugh, a quarterback, an All-American who played for Bo Schembechler, who ha had success and, and coached in a Super Bowl. Not every program has that opportunity. Michigan jumped on it. I understand it. And, you know, if, Mi if, if Michigan moved on from Jim Harbaugh in 2020, I think everyone here would have agreed that his tenure at Michigan was a failure, yeah. or at least he didn't live up to expectations. Okay. Back to back, back to back conference mm -hmm. championships, back to back playoff appearance. Probably going to put a quarterback Randy, in the as well. Yeah, Randy, Randy, you know, here's here's the way I look at it. Three, four years ago, that drama with Jim Harbor you were getting was bad drama, right? It was bad. It was Johnny yep. drama. Something always going wrong, right? You, you felt really good about it. He'd always let you down. Can't beat Ohio State. Now you have good drama. There are so many people. So many fans that would love to have the problem that you have. You know what the problem you have is? Your coach is kicking so much ass that the guys in the level above him are trying to come stealing from him. That's a high-class problem if I've ever seen one. Yeah. You'd much rather be on that love end of it. the problem scale than the other end of nobody wants this guy. We're overpaying this guy. The AD walks in his office. JG Wentworth's him. I want my money, and I want it now because you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Which is fair. Do. Which, it's which, fair. Which, it is fair. It's fair and, to want well, $10 million It's a year fair. It worked. Ball. Yeah, like it that's why part you're, of me, Randy, that that's why part of me, uh, part of me, I'll say 10%, at least sides with Ward, Ward Manuel when I say that, like, he made the contract incentive-based, and then Jim Harbaugh performed to the utmost for the first time in his tenure at Michigan. So it really did work, but at the same time, there's not that many coaches who can lead a team to back-to-back -back playoff appearances. I understand Jim Harbaugh wanting to be paid $10 million a year. I also understand the leverage, because Jake talks about it all the time, of not only can he go back to the NFL, but I, you know, he wants to go back to the NFL. He wants to win a Super Bowl, just like his brother did. But I will say, you know, just like we were talking about the Vikings quarterback situation with Kirk Cousins, trust me when I say it can always be worth worse. When Michigan hired Rich Rodriguez, Michigan football did not think there was a floor to the program. And they found out there is a floor here. So you have to be careful before you bring someone else Definitely. into that. Randy, appreciate the call, buddy. Quick, so yeah. Thanks. yeah. Hey, thanks for taking me off the ledge, guys. <laughs> uh, and anytime you're up and around here, beer's on me.
Oh, hey, we are out, so Randy. down. Oh, so down. Out, Randy. Appreciate you, go blue, buddy. All right, let's go on to Jacob here. Uh, Jacob Great wants name. to talk about Jake Paul's MMA contract. Jacob, where are you calling in from? Hey, what's going on, boys? Big fan. I'm calling in from Nashville. Oh, okay. Nashville. Nash Love Vegas. It. Nash Vegas. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So my question, um, I'm pretty sure you guys heard earlier this month, it was announced that uh, Jake Paul was signing an MMA contract with PFL. Uh, he's okay. taking it outside yep. of boxing. And it, as you guys know, he had a lot of upsets in the uh, boxing sport. Anderson Silva, Tyron Woodley, Ben Askren, MMA legends. Took him into the boxing ring. And as an MMA fan, sad to say, he uh, he whooped him. So what is your opinion on his future in MMA? Do you think he's going to get any upsets in that sport? And also, do you have any predictions on uh, big names that he might fight? Well, here's my thing with, with Jake Paul. Yeah, number one, Blaine. Blaine. You know, he's, he's not ready to fight Blaine. I don't Blaine. know why he won't fight him. Uh, you know, why don't we take a lot of detector tests? Here's my thing when you go from boxing to, to MMA. It's, it's obviously standing up and fighting is not easy. But once you introduce the element where we can stand up and fight or we can wrestle, that totally changes the game to me. We are going to see how versatile Jake Paul really is. He had a lot of success boxing MMA fighters. Let's be honest. A lot of success boxing MMA fighters. I want to see him fight somebody that that's their true profession. Not half of their profession. Not maybe the worst half of their profession, but somebody that can go to the ground or somebody that can stand up or throw them and because it gives you more ways to game plan, right? It gives you more outs. You can't just say, all right, well, I got to do A, B, or C. Well, now I can do A, B, C, D, E, F, or G. So when it comes down to how he's going to perform, the, the versatility, I think, is the biggest question. If I'm an MMA guy and he's my first fight and when I look at big names, I, I want to kind of wait a little bit to see which ones surface to the top because I do think the money that he can make in a fight is obviously going to be very attractive to whoever he's fighting because they're going to split the purse. It's going to get a ton of views. We all know that. But just deep down, I don't know if he can go to the ground and have as much success against other guys that know how to go to the ground uh, as he had boxing MMA guys. That's just my opinion, Jacob. Blaine, are you going to fight uh, Jake Paul or what? Look, man, I don't know what else I got to do. I mean, well, who do I mean? Who do I got to call? I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm glad he's joining the UFC. Okay, instead of fighting UFC fighters in boxing, especially guys who are basically done yeah. in their career. Um, I mean, I'm trying to get in there too. So, I mean, I'm two fifteen. Well, you're right? scaring Asian two, kids two, at eleven thirty at night in right now. I can fight at any weight. It doesn't matter. Give me a couple months. I mean, two max, and I'll step in the ring. At the end of the day, I think he's a good fighter. I think he looks. I think he's moving a lot better. But I know I'm better because I was just born more athletic. I love it. All right, Jacob. Thanks for calling Jacob, in. Jacob, thanks, man. Hey, let's go to Ben. Ben's calling in from Wichita, Kansas. Oh man, a lot of Kansas. A lot of Kansas today. Ben, what's up? How's it going, guys? I just had a quick question because I'm trying to make that bread today. Mm, okay. Yes. The, okay. Open that bakery. money. I'm just yeah. I'm looking at the Cowboys Bucks game. I got uh, the Cameron Bray anytime touchdown <sighs> along with Rashad White's first touchdown score of the game. How are you guys feeling about my picks? Today? Ben, I was driving up to the studio this morning thinking about Cameron Bray, and you know why you're thinking about Cameron Bray? Because you just watch what Dawson Knox did. And there's there's some similarities kind of in the way they're used in the red zone with the slam and side stuff. I I, the Cam, I would rather go Cam Brate first touchdown score and go all in mm -hmm. than go Cam Brate anytime touchdown score. When it comes to Rashad White, I actually picked Rashad White up in fantasy. And he's been a good kind of one-two punch with Leonard Fournette. And we all remember Tom Brady with who? James White, which I don't know if there's any relation between him and Rashad White. I didn't say that for that. It said they're both good catching the ball out of the backfield. And Tom Brady loves throwing the check down in the red zone. How many times have we seen Tom Brady go one, two, throw the swing? So I, I would feel better almost about taking Cameron Brait as the first time and Rashad White uh, anytime touchdown score, almost in the inverse order. Because if I'm the Cowboys and they get that ball down there, all right, because I don't think the Buccaneers, they're not going to let Mike Evans just run right by people like we've seen him do recently uh, there toward the end of the year. When they get down into the red zone, the Cowboys do a really, really good job of taking away the jump balls on the outside, the, the smashes where one's running the five-yard hitch and two's running the, the corner. They take it away, but it's that middle of the field it's that middle field. It's that little spot where Brait sits down right on the goal line from about the eight-yard line, and they hit him. So I would almost go inverse order, but at the end of the day, it's your wallet, it's your feelings, it's your emotions. Uh, you got to go with your gut. But I, I love where your head's at right now, Ben. I love where your head's at. 
Blaine, you like uh, Cameron Brait touchdown? Um, uh, to be honest with you, Ben, no, I don't. Um, but I, let me tell you what I do like. All right, you, you need to go to go to your parents' room. Right? <laughs> Lift up that mattress. All right, you grab some money out of there. All right, and you go put some money on CD Lamb to have the most receiving yards in this game. <laughs> so let me tell you what the Cowboys are going to do. The Cowboys, are, look, Kellen Moore shovel face as an offensive coordinator. He knows how to get it done, and he's going to get it to his best players. So I would do this, all right? Let's hedge it a little bit here. Put CeeDee Lamb for the most receiving yards in the game, and CeeDee Lamb to be the first touchdown scorer mm. of the game. And let me tell you how it's going to happen, all right? It's going to be a post corner, the back left of the end zone. Dak's going to find CeeDee Lamb. It's either going to be CD or it's going to be Zeke, all right? Because it's going to be either CeeDee's going to catch it or it's going to be a pass interference in the end zone. They're going to say hike and hand it off to Zeke. I'm scared about betting Bucks' first touchdown because you know why? The Cowboys are going to, win, uh, are going to get the ball first. All right, and I think they're going to go out and send a message early. I don't hate your bets, to be honest, but I just don't believe in Cameron Brait that much. What other tight end do the Bucks have that, that they feed a lot? That, that's a Blaine Crane guarantee. Oh, God, I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm trying to remember his name. He's not really a tight end. He's more like kind of an H that they'll flex out sometimes. But, hey, uh, Ben, go with that. See how it works, and if not, Blaine will give you your money back. <laughs> hey, if that works, I'll end up – you may well look out for my donation tomorrow, Blaine. Cause it's <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, hold me to it now. Yeah. I love it. Ben, Thanks so much, Ben. Buddy. Really appreciate it. How about Brian calling in from Nebraska? Brian, hey, Brian, what you got for us, man? Hey, how's it going, guys? Brian, how's it going, buddy? Uh, for- First thing, uh, thanks for reinvigorating the sporting spirit in me. Second yes, thing, sir. being in the trust tree, and yes. you're oh, a yeah. Auburn fan. Mm. I'm a Husker fan. How do I stay not hopeful for Matt Rule? Because I do not want to be let down again. Well, I just need to temper it a little bit. Yeah, here we go, Brian. I need, I need you to lock in with me. Let's let's my mouth on this thing. Here's here's the way I feel about Nebraska. I felt like Nebraska should have made more of a splash hire if it was available at first, all right? Because I think a lot of the problem with Nebraska, and I coached out there, the people that are out there, they're the most loyal fan base ever of all time. Yeah. Like, Nebraska fans are some of the most loyal, and I want them to have success because they love football the way that I love football. And I understand that, and I can feel that, and I can empathize with that. But the more I look at this Matt Rule, Nebraska kind of, you know, conglomerates, whatever you want to call it, the more I think it's kind of sneaky, David. It's kind of sneaky because Nebraska's gotten to the point right now where the standard for the fan base is very high, and it should stay that way. But the way that other people look at Nebraska, I think y'all can start to sneak some people. All right? Because all it takes at a place like Nebraska, at a place like LSU, at a place like Florida State, is a spark to start a wildfire. And let's pull up Nebraska's schedule next year, guys. So let's pull that up. The more I look at what Matt Rule kind of did in recruiting and the type of player and the type of coach that Matt Rule is, Matt Rule, to me, is the coach that likes to take the old 68 Corvette that's beat up and make it look brand new. Because that's what Nebraska is right now. They're the old Corvette that you get at a really good price that you take home and you spice that bad boy up and a year later, it's cruising around town. It's looking cool. There's girls just hopping in. You're going to Sonic and during happy hour and getting drinks. It's a great situation. But I think Matt Rule knows how to build something out of something that was burnt down. And, and I think that's why they hired him. The more I look at this hire, it's not the sexiest one. Blaine's not going to get excited about Matt Rule. All right? <laughs> but Nebraska needs to get back to eight or nine wins a year. Then you make that next plateau step. And, and once out of every three to four years, you put yourself in a position to win the conference. Let's go over that schedule real quick. Dave. At Minnesota. That's going to be a tough one. Not a good one to start That's with. That's going to be a tough one. Second one, at Colorado, Deion Sanders. Yep. Then you get Northern Illinois at home, mm-hmm. Louisiana Tech at home. Mm-hmm. You get Michigan at home. Ooh. You go to Illinois. You go okay. to Illinois. Then you get Northwestern at home. You get Purdue at home. You go to Michigan State. Okay. Maryland's coming to you. You go to Wisconsin, and then you end with Iowa at home. Man, I see seven wins there. I think they can win seven with Matt Rule. But, Brian, I don't think you should be jumping off a cliff for Matt Rule or anything like that. I think he's actually going to work out for you guys. Well, you got my hope meter up to 10, so thanks. Uh, Head people keep your boy out. Yeah, for sure. L- listen, l- let the negativity die. Now, I'm not just saying that. Uh, you know, because you're a Nebraska fan and you're calling in. I, I was very skeptical of Matt Rule at first. You can go back and see. But I just like the way he's operated. And sometimes you need a, a businessman to come in and fix it. And Matt Rule knows how to fix it. He's the fixer-upper, right? 
He's a person, he's John Taffer. He just comes in the bar and starts screaming at how dirty the place is, and y'all need to figure this crap out. And guess what? They either do or they don't. But go ahead, Blaine. I see you smirking and making giggles look, over there. Look, what do you got to say on this? You subject? read that schedule. I don't feel great about it. You saw seven. I see maybe six. And oh wow, the thing Huge about difference. it. The thing about it is, I mean, six or seven wins is a difference. Um, the Hello. thing about it is this: y'all got to hit the transfer portal hard, man. All right, you've got to hit hard. That's what's going to bring Nebraska back. Because at the end of the day, I mean, Nebraska used to kick ass in recruiting. That's what they did. They recruited, especially in the 80s or whatever the hell they went on their run. Y'all need to get back to winning the transfer portal. Y'all need a guy who could come in who's a sexy hire that could get recruits. I do think Matt, in the latter years, when he's at Nebraska, will have some success. But I don't see a lot of success early. I don't see them killing the transfer portal. So that's the only thing I'm worried about it as now. Recruiting will be fine just because it's Nebraska. But you got to win that portal. You got to win it. You got to win it. If you do that, that'll bring it back. Because right now, the teams around you aren't slowing down. Minnesota's not slowing down. Illinois. Illinois is not slowing down. Colorado just hired hired Prime. They're actually going to have some football players out there. So right now, (laughs) Matt Rule, I don't know how much success you'll have this year. I don't think it's going to be a lot. But if he starts hitting the portal and starts winning that, then I think you'll see a little shift in the tide. Well, I just feel like Matt Rule's the guy at the end of the Scooby-Doo episode that they pull the mask off and it's him. You know, it's like you never thought it was him. Like, you look at all these new coaches, mm. Brett Bielema, Prime, like you mentioned, all of a sudden. I mean, you know, who was, who was the ghost of the carnival? Oh, my God, it's Matt Rule. He's they only had game. success in college. So, yeah, I mean, that's yeah, true. It's a good outlook. Keep believing, Brian. Keep believing Appreciate in him, you, all right? Brian. Thanks Appreciate for calling you. in. All right, one more here. Let's go to Joseph from Cartersville, Georgia. Ooh, Ooh they, they play some. Stopping ground. Yeah, yeah football they play down some there football now. and baseball yeah. out in Cartersville. What's up, man? Nothing much. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Um, I want to get your old thoughts on the uh, releasing of the lifetime banning on the Braves GM, and then the big uh, international signing day the Braves had last or yesterday. I think it was twenty-one international prospects yeah. and one that they signed for two point five million. Yeah. Uh, look again. I will never ever not believe in Alex Anthopoulos. I, wh- whatever decisions that he makes, I'm good with. You know, like over time. You, you trust somebody enough where, where you feel like they know the, the recipe. And, you know, I know he caught some hell about the Freddie situation and things like that. And last year, the way the Braves performed uh, in the postseason let some people down. My biggest thing is I, I love the international players. I think they do a really good job of going out there and finding guys. I mean, you look at all the examples, right? Ozzie Alves, I can go down the list. My thing with the Braves is, and I think you, you're, you're probably going to feel the same way. They do a great job managing the roster. I just worry about injuries on the staff. That's what I worry about. Mike Soroka can't stay healthy. I don't trust Max Freed to start game one of any series in the playoffs. I just don't. I don't. I will never question the, the way that they're building it and what they've done, and they continue to make great decisions. I love the fact that they signed all these young guys to long contracts. Michael Harris, I can go down the list. I'm fine with Dansby Swanson leaving. Let the Cubs overpay for him. I know he was a part of the core, but I, I just I worry about the health of the pitching staff down the stretch. And the bullpen, you're a Braves fan, I'm a Braves fan. No bullpen scares any fan more than the Braves bullpen scares Braves uh, uh, fans. It's unbelievable. So so I'm excited about what Alex is doing, what they're doing as a team. But at the end of the day, what is your biggest worry with the Braves going into next year? Let me know. I mean, my biggest worry with the Braves going into next year is probably left field with uh, either Rosario or Azuna doing platooning. Um, I think our I think our rotation is good. I think Mike Soroka. I went to go see him do his rehab stint in Rome, Georgia, and he looked good for the three innings he pitched. Um, I think they're going to throw him in as a long reliever to begin with. See, do you not think he should? Be, why would you? Here's my question on this. We we saw this with John Smoltz. Why not just make him the closer? Hmm. Why not just make him the closer? Maybe you want him to feel feel it coming out of the pin a little bit, but you're going to go long relief. Uh, the, the way it works now in baseball, it seems like every guy just throws three innings until you get to the closer. But I, I would love to see him as the guy in the back end to have a chance to win that job, actually, in, in my opinion. And with Ozuna, I feel like Ozuna is a cancer for the team. I really believe that with all the off-the-field problems. Hell, at least Rosario's out there winning MVPs in the postseason and doing things like that. Uh, but now I, I'm very interested to see the way they kind of work in Soroka. And we know Spencer Strider is a superstar uh, on the mound. I do still like Freed, even though I just, I I really don't trust him. Uh, I don't know, man. It just, it worries me a little bit with the health of the pin. I mean, Mike Soroka has been to rehab more than Amy Winehouse. I mean, at some point, man, you got to get in there and play. 
You know, you got to rep Canada, uh, but I hope they figure it out for sure. John Smoltz had so much success as a starter before he transitioned. Yeah. I feel like the Braves are thinking we haven't even gotten the best out of Soroka as a starter. But yeah, maybe they maybe they try. But do you look long term though? Do you look long? I, I just maybe it's just a habit of of I just I look long term. But man, we really appreciate the call, my friend. Thank you, Joseph. Yep. Thank All you, right, boys. All right. Day calls. Hey, hey, really appreciate you guys calling in. We're we're gonna do it Monday, Wednesday, and Friday now, like like every week. So bring the smoke. Uh, if we go a little long sometimes on the calls, remember this show's about y'all. It's not about us. So at the end of the day, that's the most important. And guys, speaking about important, all right, Blaine, you're important, number one. I want to let you know that. Thanks. You live your truth. Our Booster Club bets are brought to you by our friends at DraftKings. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use our code Booster. Remember, new customers can bet $5 on the NFL Divisional Round. You get $200 in free Bets instantly only at DraftKings Sportsbook with our code Booster. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. All right, the first round of the playoffs is coming gone. The field of contenders is getting smaller and smaller each week as the teams compete for eternal football glory. If that's not enough to get your blood pumping, our sponsor, DraftKings. Again, like I said, all right, if you bet that five bucks on any NFL playoff game, you'll instantly receive that $200. All right, it's a great deal. All right, it's a fantastic deal. All right, Blaine, do you get it? You like I get it. Deal? Great, awesome, sweet. Deal or no Endless. deal? Howie Mandel? Yes. Should yes. I shave my head? No. And start bringing suitcases to here. No. no. You I already shaved got... the beard. What's what's you know what's one step further? No. I don't like the way you said that. Well, I'm, I I'm love the way. I don't like the way you said. I that. love the way. It's because you yeah. did 400 push-ups doesn't mean you're better than. What you. is? What are the odds? On, ass, what are the that. odds on DraftKings uh, on Blaine shaving his head? Ooh. Do I get paid out? Do I get paid out? Do I mean, you don't make any money, no. Okay, then, I mean, no. I'm not <laughs> well, see, I know, so you're in it for the money. What a terrible person. <laughs> I'm heading over to the board. Brought to you by DraftKings. Here we go. Tonight, not a bad weekend, fellas. No, not we too bad. we were up 15 units it's not good enough. on Saturday. I think we're up. I need to see what the graphic king How do you not guard Jamar bro. Chase, Ravens? Like, there's certain things I just don't get. What was your bet? Tyler Boyd to score the first touchdown. Y'all make sure to guard Tyler Boyd. Yeah, hey, guard him. He, I mean, he's been kicking everybody's ass all year. Well, it's like Josh Allen. He'd look at Stephon Diggs and be like, no, Gabe Good. Davis. It just didn't guard Jamar Chase. Jamar Chase is sitting wide open in the middle of the field. Yeah. Kyle Hamilton's like, I'm from Notre Dame. Who cares? <laughs> all right, here we go tonight. My bets. Give me uh, Leonard Fournette and Zeke. Anytime touchdown, that's together. All right, it's like a circle. It never end. All right, that's at plus 360. Then I said Cowboys money line. Look, I'm riding with the fear. All right, I'm riding with it. That's at minus 145. Conathan. I'm going to go Bucks money line. Let's see. Tom Brady, home field advantage in the me? playoffs. It's such a cool move. Well, hey, I'll take the greatest all time at thing. home plus I'll 115. Like home dogs, you know what I mean? And then why don't you go ahead and give me the under too? Bucks, Cowboys, minus under 45 and a half minus 110. All right, let's go up seven and a half units. It should have been more, but I'm a coward deep down. Um, <laughs> give me CD Lamb. Come on, Ben. Me and you, man. Me and you. And shout out uh, Mr. Shapiro. I had his birthday the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Happy belated. Give me CeeDee Lamb to lead the game of receiving. You know why? Because we need to get the best player of the ball. It's plus 195. Give me CeeDee Lamb to have more receiving yards than Mike Evans. I know Mike Evans might have scored 13 touchdowns against the Panthers, but this isn't the Panthers. So, I'm look, CD, me and you today, man. Me and you. Yeah, you I need can. you to CD the end zone. Yeah, you can see these touchdowns. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, Baby Coney's going Zeke anytime touchdown at plus 105. And Tom Brady to have more passing yards than Dak Prescott. That's minus 190. I can't believe those odds are minus 190. I would actually think it'd be the reverse in my mind. But who knows when it comes down to the NFL. But speaking of who knows, Blaine, Booster Club. Yeah, let's on? get to Tyler Jarvis. What's up, Tyler? Jar. $5 donation says, I wanted to get y'all's opinion on what's going on at Florida with the Rashada kid. Yeah. Um, as a Canes fan, I think it's absolutely hilarious. Yeah, it's this is a side effect that you're going to see of the NIL era and, and kids saying we're going and the parents don't want them to go. And it's funny, we've seen kids, like I watched Landon Collins commit to a school at the Army All-American game and his mom not even get excited when he committed to Alabama. That's insane. Mm-hmm. From, from LSU. Now imagine that with hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars. Just think about that. All right, that, that it is a wild, wild world right now. It's not a good look for Florida, but I don't think it's a good look for the kid. I don't think it's a, this is a lose lose in my opinion. Now I, I went on with Tom Luganbill and uh, Roy Philbot, uh, Norma Bar- normally Barrett Salise on, on on Sirius XM on Sunday, and was talking about you know the the pros and cons of of how good the field game is on the field right now in college football. It's the best it's ever been on the field. The product is as good as it's ever been, and then off the field. It's as turbulent and as corporatized as it's ever been. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like those dueling, 
You know, it's like angel on the one shoulder, devil on the other shoulder. You know, is, is it something where it just kind of cancels each other out? This is one of those situations that people were fearful of when you saw that kids were going to be able to pay, get paid with NIL. But again, this collectives aren't NIL. All right, that's not what name, image, and likeness is. We have lost our way when it comes to NIL. NIL, and I'll say this for the millionth time, is if Bryce Young wants to do a commercial for Dr. Pepper, that is between Dr. Pepper and Bryce Young. There doesn't need to be a collective where everybody pulls all their money in and then you go buy recruits. That's, that's not what it is. It's been warped. And I know the NCAA is trying to figure out a way to you know, navigate what would be a billion antitrust lawsuits if they tried to change the rules. So that's the part to me that, that I find fascinating. It's a bad look for both parties. And as a Miami fan, you should laugh. That's part of <laughs> All right, it. Let's go to David S. for the $5 donation. God, I love it when Booster Club fans get into it. He says, LMAO, is a Miami fan really going to talk crap, especially considering his team situation with Cormi- uh, Cormani? Yeah. Um, in the words of Joe Biden, come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I, I love when Florida, Miami, and Florida State all get pissed off at each other. And UCF's like in the back corner like, yeah. <laughs> what he right. said. Florida lost to, Miami. Like, what, Florida what lost to Vandy and Miami lost to Middle Tennessee State. <laughs> How about both y'all? Shut up. <laughs> How about that? Wow. With back? love, though. Hey, hey, hey I'm an Auburn fan. Who's Trust back me, first? Who's back first? For, uh, Florida or Miami? Miami. Go, Miami. Miami. Billy Napier won't last two more years. Said we got hired. I don't believe that. Mistake. I don't believe Mistake. that. Mistake. I don't believe that. I think right. Miami will be back quicker, but Billy Napier will figure it out. Do we have a poll? Yeah, we do. Where does Lamar end up? Saints? Mm-hmm. Dolphins? Or mm-hmm. Ravens? Ravens? I yes. would I would say that's the French way to say Raven, sorry. I would say the Saints. Mm, I think I he like comes that. marching into New Orleans. Mm. I'll go with the Ravens. Mm. Stays with the Ravens. Dolphins, 20, uh, 24%. Oh wow. Someone just voted. Saints 38%. Ravens 37%. Wow. Mm. By the, Maybe New Orleans. The hair of my chinny chin chin. Uh, all right, everybody. Thank you guys so much. Shout out to the Booster Club. Appreciate you calling in. Remember, we're going to do it Wednesday and Friday as well. It's going to be three out of five days uh, of the week. And heck, we may go more at some point in time. But again, it's the show's about you guys. It's not about us. We really appreciate y'all. Make sure you follow us on all social medias. Subscribe on YouTube. Go to the Daily Wire Plus. Become a member. All the cool kids are doing it. All right. If you're not doing it, are you really a cool kid? I don't know. We'll see. Are you really in the trust tree? Let's find out. We may have to sit down and read one of those notes to you, like the intervention. But got a great show tomorrow. Got some great guests this week. NFL, college football offseason, college basketball is heating up, fellas. NBA is heating up. Mm-hmm. NHL is cooling off, which is a good thing when it comes to hockey True. because they play on ice. Uh, but remember, like I said, you guys are the best part of it. Shout out to the Booster Club as well. And like the chances of Kirk Cousins throwing it past the first down marker on fourth and eight. We're going, going, gone.